I'd like to talk about a little bit today from the Word of God is the Lordship of Christ. What does it mean, the Lordship of Christ? That means, first of all, that God wants us to be subject to Him and be our, He wants to be our master. He wants us to set aside our will and do the will of God and be willing to do the will of God. If you would turn with me to, uh, if you have scripture, to turn to Revelation chapter 19. We see at the second coming of Christ, everyone will be subject to uh, Christ. And, and so we notice here, starting at verse 11 in Revelation chapter 19. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many, many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the heavens, midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. This is what's going to take place in the future when Jesus comes back to rule and reign here on earth for a thousand years. Now Jesus came the first time as a humble servant to be a sacrifice for us. But the second time, he's coming to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <clears throat> and so we read, <clears throat> if you could turn me again to Philippians chapter 2, I'm just going to look at a couple of the verses that you already read. But here in Philippians chapter 2, we notice that Jesus, in verse 7, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, and even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. Now, as uh, be, being involved in the ministry now full time for 48 years, I've realized over the years that the name of Jesus is a powerful name. And of course, we always close our prayers in the name of Jesus. Because the name of Jesus means a deliverer, He's our Savior. And He became a man. And, became one of us, took on human flesh, but one day he's going to come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, in order for us to allow God to be our master, we become his servant. We become willing to submit our will to his will every day. When we get up in the morning, we say, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do today? I want to do something for you. I want to submit my will to your will. Well, growing up as a young person, I had a favorite aunt. Her name was Bertha. 
She was a, a nurse. And uh, God called her to be a missionary out in Arizona to the Navajo Indians. And so I remember as a very young person that uh, we sent off Aunt Bertha. She was my favorite aunt, my dad's sister. She became a missionary amongst the Navajo Indians in Arizona, northeast Arizona, way up in the tip of the state of Arizona. And um, she ministered there as a nurse. And she met a Navajo man who was a preacher, pastor. And they fell in love and they got married. And then my uncle was, was now Nazareth, Nazareth Burbank. We adopted him into our family and accepted him. And we were proud that we could be part of his life and ministry as well as my aunt in Arizona. Well, this is one of his paintings, my uncle's paintings. This is a judge, a Navajo, Navajo judge, picture of a judge. And my uncle is in his 90s, and he still has a radio program uh, going over to, uh, to, to, to so his people in Arizona can hear about Jesus. And God has blessed him with health all these years. But my aunt got Lou Gehrig's disease and died a very difficult death a number of years ago. And she, of course, is in heaven with Jesus and all those who have gone before. But she was an influence on me in my life so that when I was approached as a young person and had finished college and I was working in a ministry as a probation officer, I mentioned that I had 100 boys on probation in Montgomery County. I started Sunday night services. They had no Christian uh, uh, activities at Montgomery Hall here in Montgomery County. So in uh, 1968, I did God's work in that way as a probation officer, started services on Sunday night, led a lot of these young people to Christ and to have faith in Jesus. But then my uncle and other men in our church were uh, got to know and they helped to support a missionary in Brazil. And so when this missionary was visiting here in the summer of 1986, or 68 rather, they invited me for lunch. And this missionary from Brazil looked at me and said, God is calling you to be a missionary in Brazil. And I said, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, he says, you pray about it. We need your help in Brazil. This was in 1968. And so I prayed about it for a year and then decided I would try it for a year. And so the people who prayed for me, who said I should go, that this is God's calling on my life, I submitted my will to the will of God, to Jesus. And I went to Brazil in the beginning of 1969, and I stayed five years, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Brazilians, all over southern Brazil. Brazil is a large country, as large and maybe a little bit bigger without Alaska as the United States is. And so I saw thousands of people every night hear the gospel of Jesus Christ for five years. For one whole month, we would be out evangelizing every evening and then take two weeks off. But what a privilege it was to be a missionary. I had to submit my will to the will of God. But then I got sick with hepatitis and had to come back to America. And then when I came back to America, I was recovering, and I asked God, now, what do you want me to do? You want me to go back to Brazil, or do you want me to stay here in America? Well, God seemed to be leading me to stay in America and be a missionary, so to speak, in my own turf, in my own backyard, in my own country, in my own state, in my own town. And so I began to go into prisons. God opened up the door to do prison ministry for 20 years. In fact, more than that. But the fact of it is that we have to be willing to submit our will to the will of God. That means we don't always know what's going to happen, how God is going to use us, unless we're willing to be an instrument of God. Now, the Apostle Paul, 
here in the Bible, he was, he was thinking that he was doing God's will, but he was persecuting the Christians. And so God met him. Well, let's take a look what happened after God met him. He became a missionary to his own people. Not only to his own people, but also to the Gentiles. And so when we look at Acts 21, he had now come towards the end of his ministry here in, in, in his time and to his own people as well as to the Gentiles. And then he was coming to the end of his ministry. And we notice in chapter 21 of Acts, starting at verse 8, we notice that there was a person, he went to, he went to visit Caesarea to do God's work there. And there in Caesarea, in verse 8 of Acts 21, we notice that he entered the house of Philip, an evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now, this man had four daughters who prophesied. And as we, they stayed in those days, a certain prophet named Agabus came and had a message for Paul. He came to us in verse 11. He, to, he uh, took Paul's uh, belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from the place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. But Paul felt that it was God's will to go up to Jerusalem. They didn't agree. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also uh, to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we drop the subject, we see saying, the will of God be done. That was what all of them decided they were going to do with themselves. They were going to do God's will. They were going to submit their will to God. And so we know in verse 15, and after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. That is, he followed God's leading for his life. Now, it's interesting you know that when we're willing, submit our will to God's will, Sometimes it may even mean dying for him. Because all around the world today, people are dying for their faith in Jesus Christ. We are blessed to live where we live. I don't know of anybody who's dying in America for Christ. Do you? I realize, you know, when they had that happening in, uh, there in uh, Oregon, um, or California, was it? That when these terrorists, they were picking out the Christians and putting them to death and not putting the others to death. And of course, this was America. Now we notice that Paul now was going on trial. And we notice that he appeared before the governor, Felix. And in Acts chapter 24, we notice, for example, verses 14 and 15, we notice that he was going to be heard by the governor of, of that time. And so we notice in verse 14, and this is Paul's testimony. This I confess to you, Governor Felix, that according to the way, capital W, which they call a sect, so I worship. I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Then we go to uh, verse 30, 21. We notice that Paul says, unless it is for this uh, one statement which I cried out standing among them in, in the temple, 
And that's why he got arrested concerning the resurrection of the dead. I am being judged by you this day, governor. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, that's our way in Christ, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lystra, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on this case. So he commanded Centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for him or visit him, but he was to stay in prison. He was willing to go to prison for his faith. This was Paul, the apostle, the one who wrote all these letters in the New Testament, what, 13 of them. And he was willing to do anything God wanted him to do. Then he later appeared to King Agrippa. <clears throat> we notice that King Agrippa uh, <clears throat> was the king. And so he was now appearing before King Agrippa. And you, we, you read this, this passage this morning a, a little while ago. I just want you to notice a couple things in this passage here in Acts chapter 26. We notice in verse 17, he said, I will deliver you. This was Jesus talking to Paul on the road to Damascus when he was struck down by light, a forceful light. And then he, he was encountered, he encountered Jesus. He says, I, Jesus said to him, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn from them from wicked darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And then we notice King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. My question to you today is, what has God called you to do with your life? Have you heard from God yet what God wants you to do with your life? What does he want you to do for him? And so Paul gave us an example. It was his example that he was willing to do whatever God wanted to do him to do. Well, uh, we notice here in chapter 26 that Paul realized that his time was up. And we know from church history that the Apostle Paul was beheaded for his faith. He was willing to die for his faith. We are a blessed people, as I mentioned earlier. But we notice that when <clears throat> the uh, king heard the testimony of Paul, he was almost convinced to be a follower of Christ, but not quite enough. And what does Paul say to him? We notice towards the end of the chapter, in verse 29, uh, Paul said, responded to the king. He said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. I've been working with young men in prisons for many years who uh, some will never get out of prison. And um, one young man was a drug dealer in Philadelphia back in the, in the uh, 80s. A big drug dealer in North Philadelphia. And um, he ended up in prison. And a friend of mine who also ministers in prisons was ministering at, at a service at, at uh, one of the prisons in Philadelphia when this friend of mine was there as a prisoner and he heard the gospel. He got saved and he had his trial. He left at home a uh, young wife with one of his children in her womb. He had a son and he had a daughter who was not yet born. So he was, went to court, had a trial, and he was sent to prison for a whole lifetime, never to get out. 
His name is Chuck. And um, so Chuck would never get out of prison. I got to know him in 1991 at Greater Ford Prison. He um, appealed, he appealed the, um, what was, uh, happened, his decision of the court. And over a nine year period, he tried to have another trial. But it never happened. It never happened. So, his little girl, baby girl, was born while he was in prison. His wife became a Christian. His wife would come to visit Chuck with a baby girl and a little boy, son. And he would tell them that one day he's hoping to get out of prison. But to this day, unless a governor signs for him to get out, he'll never get out of prison. He's been there now since 1991. He's getting gray hair. He witnesses for his faith in prison. He continues to be a dad and a husband to his wife and family. They come to see him every week. But one day, one day, he's going to be together with his family in heaven. But till, till, that, till Christ comes, He's going to be there. And so his faith is important. It's more important than anything else. Anything else that ever happens to us as a people is never as, as important as knowing Christ, having this gift of eternal life. In closing, I want you to turn to John chapter 15, if you have a Bible. There's a couple verses here that I want you to see. And... Um, John here at 15, we notice uh, something very important about our faith. We notice in verse 1, the Apostle Jesus speaking to us. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he proves that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. I accepted Jesus in 1956, October, in the hospital in Norristown, as a 15-year-old teenager. I asked Jesus to come into my heart and save me. He gave me a new life. I stopped running around with the bad friends that I was running around with. I stopped lying and cheating and swearing, and, and I started living for Jesus and talking about him. And uh, here I am now. I turned 75, 75 on January 19. And um, well, I've served now in full-time ministry 48 years. Can we have a pic couple of pictures? I have a couple of pictures. This is my family. My wife was from Brazil. She accepted Jesus through our ministry in Brazil and she came here to study in college, Valley Forge Christian College. And um, we got married in 1977. She was willing to leave Brazil and to come and live here and be my wife. Her mother was not very happy about it for a while, but she finally said it's okay. So we would visit often. Sometimes our friends from Brazil would visit. But my wife is the one over here beside me. And uh, Daisy was her name. They named her, her mother named her after a missionary that she loved very much in Brazil, American missionary. And um, what happened was that she got cancer five years ago. 
And so, for two years at the University of Pennsylvania, I would take her constantly. She died next month, it'll be three years ago. But we have two wonderful daughters. She got married six years ago. This is Christiani in the middle. And my son-in-law is from Egypt. He became a Christian when he was a teenager in Egypt and uh, moved to America when he was 17. And Well, they got to know each other. My daughter lived in New York and worked up in New York. They got married. My other daughter is Luciana, over on this side. She's still not married, but she um, has had a ministry in prison, and she also has worked a good job. And um, when Luciana was born, she was very sick. That was in 1978. She was very sick. She hardly moved her arms and her legs. She just laid there. And so we knew that she was going to die as a baby unless God would touch her and heal her. A friends, friends of ours prayed that God would heal Luciana. She was only two days old. They put her in an incubator and uh, my wife and I we took a dab of oil, bottle of oil, put it on her little tiny head, forehead. And we prayed that Jesus would heal Luciana. And I, and I stand up here today as a testimony that within an hour, we saw Luciana start to move her arms, move her head open and close her eyes, move her legs. They kept her two more days. This was up at Grandview Hospital up in Sellersville. And um, they kept her two more days. And they said, you can take her home with you if you take her for some more tests at, at the Children's Hospital here in Philadelphia. So we took her to the Children's Hospital with all the test results, the x-rays, etc. And they looked her, looked her over, and the doctor said, as far as we know, she's okay. You can take her home. So she came home. She was our firstborn. And here she is in the wedding back six years ago. And, um, and then before my wife passed away, we wanted grandchildren. And so the grandchildren came. You put the other picture. There they are. Three of them. And um, you notice that he's my only grandson. His name is Leo. And this is Adriana and Alessandra. My wife never saw the twins. They were in my, in, in, uh, my daughter's womb in her belly when she died. But someday... My wife is going to get to know her little twin grandchildren. They are a blessing. Because God wants us to be fruitful, right? And we already are telling our little grandson, my little grandson, Leo, about Jesus. You know, you were singing, Jesus loves me today. <clears throat> I sang that as a child, right? Growing up, I grew up in church. And, and the fact of it is that I believe if the Lord tarries and if the Lord doesn't come back, that these three grandchildren are grow, grow, grow up to be special uh, messengers of Christ in their lives. And um, right now he wants to be a policeman, but I tell him, I think you're going to be a preacher someday. <laughs> but the fact of it is that we need <clears throat> to submit our will to God's will, whatever comes into our lives. I thought that God was going to heal my wife. We prayed and believed that. But God took her. So I had to submit, we had to submit our wills to God. God had a purpose and a reason. 
and uh, I was blessed to know her for many years, and the fact of it is that we as God's people need to let the Lord Jesus be our Lord and Master and our the one who makes who leads us and guides us and makes helps us to make the right decisions. Now you may be here today and um, you might say to yourself, well I already accepted Christ and I'm serving him in, on the job and that's good. That's wonderful. But what if God would come along and say I want you to be a missionary, I want you to do something else. Would you be willing to do it? I never wanted to be a pastor. <clears throat> I pastored three churches for 38 years, three different churches. A month ago, I retired from being a pastor. And I've gotten to know Pastor Lee at, at some of our pastor's meetings. And so I don't know what God's going to do with my life. I'm seeking him at 75 years of age. I want to know, God, what do you want me to do next? I already served him 48 years. And so God wants us to be willing to follow him. And remember when Jesus called his disciples, he said one thing follow me and then that was it they followed him they left whatever they had and they followed him today we don't relate very well to that but my question to you is are you willing to submit your will to God's will father we thank you today for our friends here at this church I pray in a special way that if there's someone here who doesn't know you in a personal way through Jesus that they would receive the Lord Jesus into their hearts. And if there's any Christians here today who, who are thinking about whether they're willing or not willing to submit their will to you, that you would speak to their hearts. And we believe, Father, that maybe all of them, maybe most of them, have already submitted their will to your will. But if there's some who haven't yet done that, that you would speak to their hearts. Thank you for the example of Paul who was willing to submit his will to yours. And you, Lord Jesus, you met Paul on the road to Damascus. And he followed you, was willing to die for you. And so, Father, we thank you today for being with us, that you would guide us this day, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you. 